Hi, I'm Ben. And I'm Ernie. And I'm Jeremy. And this is Budget Nerds. Who is all in your mind? You are not alone. <laughs> no, you are not. All right. Well, we have a very special guest, Jeremy from the Personal Finance Club. Welcome, welcome. Hi, guys. I'm so honored to be here. So, Jeremy, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, what you do uh, first, and then we want to hear about your YNAB story. But Jeremy's an old friend of YNAB uh, and a really awesome teacher in the personal finance space in general, and we're just super excited to have you on. Thanks. Yeah, I I think my 10-year YNAB anniversary will be in February, so I've been using it over nine years now. And and starting about five years ago, I started... Um, basically teaching personal finance and investing. And most of my content is more on the investing side. Um, I actually have two rules uh, to build wealth. Rule number one <laughs> is to live below your means, which is all about what YNAB is kind of like the entire app is about. Um, and then the rule number two is invest early and often. And so, yeah, that's what I do. I teach personal finance. Um, you know, we have a website, Instagram, social media, all that stuff. And I've been a long time YNAB user, you know, long before, you know, this part of my life started. Nice, nice. Yeah. And you've, how long have you had the personal finance club, like official, uh, all that, the whole brand and everything? How, how long have you been doing that? started in 2019. So that's about, yeah, oh, five okay. and a half years now. Okay. It's not as long as I thought. So I guess before that, were, were you teaching personal finance stuff before that, or was that the beginning of it? That is the you? beginning. Although, you know, I feel like I've been doing it a long time. People often will, I mean, it's official. Like I registered the domain, I created the accounts in 2019. So there's, there's a hard start uh-huh. then, but I often have people message me being like, I've been following you since 2015. I'm like, that's not possible because it didn't exist. <laughs> You're like, really? <laughs> but I'm flattered. People just feel like <laughs> yeah, it's been so long. <laughs> my my uh, education feels like it just has been droning on for so long. Um, well, that was my first thought too. I was like, I feel like you've been around forever, but you have a large, especially like, I feel like a lot of wine numbers probably know about you. Um, we have a similar vibe. Like, I feel like we have a similar uh, just kind of voice and style and, um, you know, just kind of casual, but friendly, you know, and helpful and funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Funny. <laughs> Did I, Jeremy, I saw it was your Instagram post this morning about, what is it? Looking for someone in investing Oh, Six yeah. five, blue eyes. Yeah, there's, I'm, I'm looking it up right now. Some <laughs> TikToker had made a what I assume is a joke. Like her kind of like dating profile wants, and she's like looking for a man in finance with a trust fund. Six five, blue <laughs> eyes, and it's like this like ridiculously yeah. narrow um, criteria that I feel like a lot of you know I, I want to like paint with a broad stroke, but it seems like some people in the dating world have very very narrow. Uh, <laughs> Yes. targets and i'm like ooh, that's not a very big portion of the of the population <laughs> but i'm like wait a minute that almost describes me like i don't think i'm actually the person <laughs> she's looking for because i'm not like working on wall street over <laughs> but i do teach finance i do have blue eyes i do technically have a trust account although it wasn't like given to me by my parents I mean... <laughs> um and then but unfortunately yeah but then i measured Just myself and i'm actually six foot four <laughs> and so i just threw the oh, tape measure down and, breaker Still yeah, no, it's like even, <laughs> even I was so close, but you know, well, hopefully she finds her <laughs> six five finance guy. Wow, I feel like you're tall enough. Maybe she can make a comment. <laughs> no, yeah, I, mean, I, I want anyone to settle, okay? If you want six five, uh, maybe just wear some platform shoes or something. I don't no, know. That's right. <laughs> Go on my toes a little bit. I love it. Well, why don't you tell us? Yeah, so 10 years ago, you got into wine up. Tell us your wine up story what, and your just your personal finance story in general. Because I know you've uh, you've made some big strides for sure. Yeah, I mean, so my story is that I started a company in college and bootstrapped it. And so for like the first 10 years of my career, my max take home salary was $36,000 a year. And I was living extremely frugally, like, you know, I was kind of like, I was living in San Diego for half of that. So it was, it wasn't like super low cost of living Oof. or anything like that. Um, yeah, for real. 36,000 in San Diego is like right. <laughs> starvation wages. No, right? I, I remember at the time I was Almost. like, I, what's the poverty line here? Should I be like looking for like, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, I was obviously like a, a privileged person, like went to a great college and had an opportunity to go mm-hmm. get a job. But I was like, I think I might be like 
borderline poverty line here. Um, but I just lived like I drove a 99 Ford Explorer that I bought for $3,000 in cash. I lived with roommates. I, you know, uh, eating out splurge was like Subway or something, not like a fancy sit down dinner. Um, and for a lot of the time, I just, my budgeting technique was just don't spend any money because you don't have any money. Um, right, right. And then I found YNAB and it was, it was a few months before I ended up selling my company. And so I had this kind of weird YNAB experience where for a few months I was like living on extremely low income. And then I had this big windfall because I sold my company for yeah. just over $5 million. Um, but the, the frugality that was like beaten to me as a child and then was a necessity for all of my twenties and mid up to mid thirties, um, was so baked into me. I like kind of fell in love with YNAB and, you know, I was the guy I was like dating back then, like every first date, it would come up and I'd be like, you got to download it. I'm like, get out your phone. <laughs> like, and I love it. and I love it. just like <laughs> p- pitch it to people. I'm like, you know how you like, you know, you look in your bank account and there's like a big pile of money there. And you like, you think you can afford something, but then rent comes up. You're like, where'd that money go? I'm like, that's what YNAB solves. Um, and so I just like I totally, um, it, it just totally clicked for me. And I was, you know, so yeah, since I started 10, almost 10 years ago, I guess over nine years ago, um, back then there was no um, bank connections. The only mm-hmm. way to get your- um, You have four back in the day. Right. Your only way to get your um, transactions in is to enter them manually. And people that, for me, I, I almost feel bad for people who start now because that was like a really eye-opening experience for me is just entering all the transactions Mm -hmm. because I think we all kind of operate with this assumption that our financial life is so hectic and complex. There's just money flying in and out of accounts all the time. And it's just this big Mm -hmm. whirlwind. And you mentioned on a previous episode that a lot of people kind of like, it's not a lot, but some people don't like the magic of why it doesn't click immediately because it just feels like they're just kind of tracking accounts and, and they're not proactively you know, making those decisions. But when mm-hmm. I actually had to enter every transaction, it kind of, you know, and when I pitched that to people too on first dates, they'd say, uh, I would never do that. That'd be so incredibly time consuming. If it's so how, complicated, how could I possibly yeah. find time to do that in a day? <laughs> and I would ask like, how many text messages do you send a day? And they're like, I don't know, 600. And I'm like, well, <laughs> on average, I have like one or two financial transactions a day. You know, this turns out, I use my credit card once. I might have like a checking account thing once every three or four days. Mm. It just, there's not that much happening. You know, it's not like you're making 30 transactions a day. That's, that'd be outrageous unless you're like running some sort of business or something like that. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of got in the habit. Whenever I went to the grocery store, I'd pull my credit card, I'd pull my wine app and then enter the, enter the uh, transaction. And then I would then have like really, you know, then you're like kind of living right in your categories, you know, if you got the money there. And so that was like a really formative part of my wine experience. And also I think was this formative part of my financial experience, realizing that, you know, your finances aren't this impossibly complex situation. It's like one or two additions or subtractions a day and you could wrap your head around that, you know? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm sure Ernie, Ernie could speak to this teaching workshops. I feel like everybody thinks that their financial situation is like the outlier, like the most complicated thing, but like not really. <laughs> I mean, there, there are some folks that have some really complicated situations, but mostly it's it's pretty much all the same. <laughs> you know. And you're right, like when you actually start writing down your transactions and, and keeping track, it, all that complexity kind of collapses into well, what it is, which is actually not that complex as you think because i think you just when you think about your your spending you think about all your spending like you think about all your bills and like like you think about your whole spending for like a month you know but when you take it day by day it's actually not that much you know yeah i was just gonna say that ben doing a little bit every single day that's Mm -hmm. what makes the difference and so you got in the habit of doing that, Jeremy. And that's what I always tell folks at workshop, like just find something you already do. Just add YNAB on top of it. One or two minutes per day, deal with the transactions from the previous day. Yeah. And it becomes yeah, part that. of you. I did draw the line though. I When I first started using YNAB, I had a cash account. And so um, just like, you know, your credit card, your checking, I actually have like a wallet account and then when i we have one me and ernie have one too we did an oh, episode yeah. about how much we love them. oh so do you actually about to say do you, do you don't like them yeah so. we, 
Yeah, I. Yeah. You hate it's him, okay. Don't you? It's, I mean, it's, so it's, I, it's I did right. it for a while. So if I <laughs> took out two hundred bucks from the ATM, I would do a transfer from you know checking to wallet, and then when I paid in cash, and I th- I think I kept that going for a few months. So I was like, okay, that's that's line for me. I, I'm I'm just, it's I'm gonna consider <laughs> it's a cash <laughs> spent money because I because yeah, I don't. Yeah deal with the cash that much and i don't just sometimes it's like tips and all this stuff it just so i don't know maybe i'm maybe i'm a hypocrite because i'm immediately saying ah cash is too complex but the truth is no it's it's well the cash is harder because you don't have any record of it unless you keep a receipt and you know you gotta you like gotta enter that right away otherwise you have problems but uh yeah ernie and i are of one mind where we we love cash accounts (laughs) we did a whole episode on it it. 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 we'll convince you but uh if we don't it's okay we're not mad at you let's (laughs) balance the account let's see okay i got $11. I think it's just like I want another thing to balance because it's fun. Uh, it's just, but something I'm curious about, uh, just think about your YNAB story, Jeremy. So you found YNAB borderline mm-hmm. poverty, right? Thirty six thousand dollars, I think you said, and then all of a sudden you become a multimillionaire with the sale of this business, and you keep using YNAB. I mean, I think a lot of people, once you come and do a big sum of money, right, like all the money problems go away. I don't need to do any tracking. I can just kind of do whatever. What was your mentality during that big windfall yeah. I th- shift? I, th- I think that's a good point because I do think a lot of people also operate in the assumption that there's you know a, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It's like once your bank account hits X, then right. all of these things will happen. I'll be happy. I won't have money problems. Uh, you know, my my life's work will be solved or whatever. Um, and you know, I had a very atypical experience of like kind of going from the beginning of the rainbow to the end of the rainbow, like in an instant, like in a refresh of my bank account. Um, And the days just went forward. I had the same friends. Uh, I wasn't in, you know, much more happier, much less happy. Um, And, and my own like YNAB experience has kind of migrated over the years. Initially, I didn't want to be one of those um, like, garbage man who wins the lottery and then like spends it all and then becomes a garbage man again. And so I was like, right, you know, and right. I, I cleared about 2 million bucks after taxes. And so, um, it was a lot of money. Like there's a ton of money. Don't get me wrong, but also, you know, you can spend 2 million bucks, you know, you buy some cars, it's not as much as it used to right, be. Right. Exactly. You know, it's, you're not like in <laughs> private true. jet territory. You're like, okay, maybe if I invest this wisely, I can like live modestly. And so I kind right. of just went, forward for a few years with the exact same mentality like you know watching my spending every month like i'm um, just trying not to burn through it and then over the years I, I kind of have it has sunk in now that i don't need to be looking at you know national brand versus a uh, generic brand at the grocery store anymore like that those right. numbers just don't impact my bank account um in the way that is not like a rounding error and so i've i've kind of become less obsessive about really small categories and more i use it as kind of an overall financial health picture so i use it like every single dollar to my name is in YNAB. if someone asks me my net worth like you know just in the media i do or whatever or my post or whatever i often want to know my net worth i know to the dollar because every single account i guess except for the cash in my wallet so whatever whatever <laughs> okay. says plus like okay. a couple, 63 a couple hundred bucks yeah. so give or take right. Right? <laughs> um, yeah obviously some of that small stuff doesn't matter but yeah like every investment account my home um business interest um i even have like a little tiny bit of crypto that i put in there i'm like looking at it right now mm-hmm. um you know real estate things like that and and you know most of those aren't tracking accounts or budget accounts and or and most or sorry most of those aren't budget accounts they're tracking accounts and Mm -hmm. and most of those aren't linked at all those are just me reconciling um you know monthly or so and i also love that as a system of records so if one of my investment accounts comes back and is off by 10 grand um i might not know i might not just be able to see that because it's a big enough number but if it's in YNAB, then i'll at least have like every single month I've been reconciling. And so, yeah, it went from me just, you know, using the, you know, categories very, just like I was when I was, um, you know, living at 36,000 to now I still, you know, I still reconcile every month and everything, but I'm kind of less like pulling up YNAB at the grocery store to see if I have money in my groceries category. Yeah, a um, little more broad yeah. categories, I yep. imagine. And uh, Well, let's get into those categories. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this is, you know, you sent these ahead of time. So I looked through them. 
the fewest categories by far of any wine ever we've really? ever had on the show. I think I counted sixteen. <laughs> oh, this will be interesting then, because yeah, this will be great. Because I really want to get in your process and your thinking. And uh, yeah, I think I think all the folks we've talked to so far have like. I don't know, like 60 really? categories or something. Okay. So this one might actually not be an hour and a half long, like, we've, <laughs> <laughs> like we have with some of the others. So that's cool. That's cool. I, I want. I'm really interested to see how you do this. I mean, I do. I do think that speaks to my shift in mentality. Like I said, when I was totally like the difference was between spending thirty two thousand and thirty one thousand back back in the day was a big difference. Now, right. you know, that doesn't make any difference to me. And so my categories have definitely gotten more broad, and they're more just like yeah somewhat curiosities and actually i can reduce my categories further because i have a fuel category still and my car no longer takes fuel as of oh uh, there you ooh, go. last year sometime you just get an electric car yeah um but that's fun sometimes i fill up my girlfriend's car and so i guess i still put it on there <laughs> i guess you need something yeah. <laughs> yeah well i love the simplicity i mean seriously as soon as i opened up the screenshots i was like ooh, i here's some ideas i have for my budget now yeah, maybe want to change things up. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting to say because I'm always trying to simplify categories and combine things. And I feel like I have too many sometimes. And maybe the reason why I feel like I have too many is because, yeah, like you, Jeremy, I mean, it was over a much longer period of time, but I'm starting to feel like I'm more OK than I, I used to be, you know. So, yeah, I might get some ideas from this, too. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I am very hesitant to espouse about what I think YNAB is about to the actual budget nerds. But I guess oh, please do. I can only speak to, <laughs> to like my perspective. And so I'd say like, I only have a category if like basically one of two things are true. And I'm a little bit speaking off the top of my head here. One is if I am worried about needing like needing money for that. So for example, um, you know, car maintenance is something that uh, you don't want to have a $500 expense come up when you weren't planning on that and, and again like in my situation mm -hmm. i might have enough but like still like i, I want to like those things that are going to come up later you know embrace your true expenses what we used to call yeah. safe for a rainy day i'm going to keep like bringing yes. up the old rules <laughs> um and uh, it's, yes. and it's it reflected in my uh category names but um yeah so things that like you know need to be saved for but you don't have like a monthly expense for is like one category of thing that i want to separate and another is just things i'm curious about and so i still keep groceries versus restaurants um i could just combine those and have a food category and i think that would be fine but i guess i use that as kind of an insight to my health where you know hmm. and maybe laziness yeah. a little bit where you know eating at restaurants is just less healthy than eating at home you know almost any way you you uh, slice it and so um mm -hmm. some months my groceries category is higher and sometimes my restaurants category is way higher. And I think that kind of correlates to like, you know, what my fitness level is for that month. Yeah. Yeah. You triple the butter and salt. That's why restaurants taste so good. Right. So. Exactly. <laughs> I know the amount of butter you would never in any world cook with at home. They just throw right in there and you don't think about it because it right. just served you, you know? Exactly. Well, all right, let's get into your categories. Do you have like a, I haven't actually seen them. Uh, so do you have like a list of the, the groups first or? Uh, yeah, I can them, go, go through. Go I got the whole thing up. I was able to fit the whole thing into one massive screenshot. You guys said to break it down by category. Nice. But I was like, I think I can, I can work it and get it all. Oh in yeah, one. you got, you got the yeah. Since you don't have so many, you can, uh, you can actually see it all in one. Yeah, and so uh, the first categories uh, or the first group, the like the group of categories is that called a group? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the first group, group I just yeah. called monthly expenses, and there's four things: groceries, which I just talked about, restaurants fuel which i also mentioned and then uh -huh. spending money and spending money okay i used to have like household items clothes uh yeah how much know. does that encompass you know? right exactly <laughs> that and you used to have multiple categories for that right and so i used to have like all sorts of those little categories and at some point i was like it doesn't matter to me if i'm buying toothpaste or a pair of jeans that's just kind of hmm. flexible spending that doesn't really fit in another category. And I, I don't feel like it falls into one of those categories where I'm like, I don't really need to save up for a pair of jeans. And I also don't really care where that money is going today. Like maybe I'll change mm -hmm. in the future if I'm like worried about my clothes budget or something. Um, and so spending money covers everything. And honestly, these is like half Amazon, just like the stuff I buy on Amazon. And that's kind of yeah. like my, you know, swiping of the card, the stuff that I'm using that's not auto pay, that's just, how I spend it. So that's kind of like when I and and the and the um 
the screenshot I sent you, I auto assigned it pretty closely. You know, we're a few days in the month, but I did an auto assign of my average spending. And so you can see, oh, nice. and also like, I'm like a transparent guy. You guys were very um, kind about yes. saying, like, don't need to include amounts or anything. But one of the things that I'm passionate about in personal finance is I think people have this like view of wealth that like, oh, millionaires do this or, um, you know, you know, rich people spend money this way. And I think mostly those like, pop culture views of wealth are wrong. I think most millionaires live frugally and drive a used car. And, mm. um, you know, I, I just had a guy's house a few days ago who had this like multi-million dollar beach home and he invited me over there. It's like, I was like, oh, this guy's really rich. Like he's richer than me. I don't have a multi-million. And, and like, he had a little like fire pit out front. Um, I was like, oh, it's a nice fire pit. He's like, he's like, yeah, I got that offer up. There's like someone that was like, just bought it. I was like, I was like, you're like, you're buying multi-million dollar beach homes and still <laughs> looking at offer up to save some money on a, Fire pit. I was like, I mean, but that's the mentality, right? You I love it. You generally, yeah, yeah. most people don't just get wealthy by coming into huge sums of money and just spending wildly. They have a like, frugal mentality, and you know that's what Wine hmm. built goes right to. Yeah. So that's my. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing because the nerds will love it. I mean, yeah. and I know if, if if you guys want to know more, I know Jeremy on on social. You just let it all hang out. So <laughs> so, so, so you. Yeah. I mean, you, you definitely my only fans. really believe in. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Not like that. <laughs> but, but you know, you just uh, uh, yeah, you believe in transparency and you you share a lot. So it's really really uh, cool of you. Yeah. So I'll mention. So that, quick those, question. Those four categories. My average spending i think over the course of my wine abuse is is just over two thousand dollars two thousand seventy one dollars and so and embarrassingly the okay. the lion's share of those four categories groceries is 382 restaurants 818 fuel 440 although i think that one might be wrong because i have zeroed that out because i don't have a gas car anymore and then spending money is 830 and so i'm basically putting about two thousand bucks a month just like of random money on my credit card uh, yeah, sounds right. Sounds about right. Yeah. So, average spending in groceries since the beginning, right around 2015, 382 dollars for groceries. Yeah. But, wow. Although most of that, <laughs> Ernie's impressed. I mean, but like obviously, <laughs> restaurants is 800. So a lot of times I'm eating out, and right. Um, right. And only recently have like I moved in with my girlfriend, so like uh, mostly just like you know single person eating. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think that's I think that's about right. You know, a couple of Costco cool. trips a month and fill in the rest with restaurants. Yeah. So the spending money categories that include fun things. Yeah. If I buy okay. a drone or something, that would be spending money. Oh, um, that's fun. I love that. Yeah, I don't know. I, I've definitely been living the single life. So my 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 brother, um, I don't mention him much, and he doesn't hasn't chosen to be financially transparent. So I'll I'll be careful as I. But <laughs> he has it, a family of five, and I feel like he he also you know, like you know, has spending categories with his fam family. And so he keeps his like fun money in this like little separate bucket that he keeps artificially small in my opinion. But for me, I'm just like, oh, whatever. It's like, if it's, <laughs> if it's toothpaste or a drone at all, it's just spending money. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, it is interesting. Like when you, when you do a family, it, it's, I, I don't know. I feel like, yeah, sometimes you need to be more clear just for communication between with a partner, you know, like on like, uh, what are you spend that on? You know, just so, uh, you know, you, you both know it's all what you agreed to, you know, so I can see like when you're, when you're single, you just collapse a lot of these things into one spending category. Cause yeah, you, know, you don't have to like answer to somebody else, yeah. you know, so that's changes. Yeah, things no, for that's sure. true. And I'm actually kind of going through that transition right now where now I'm living together and we're like trying to, you know, decide mm. how we do finances and things like that. And so maybe this will shift. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, it definitely makes a big difference. Cool. All right. So that's, and I, I remember I'm, I'm already like getting uh, memories from Wine Up Four Days because monthly bills. I know that was like the top. That, that, it sounds like you just, you just did like the old Wine Up Four defaults. Is that right? Definitely. How I mean, for your groups, you know, I think over the years it's been a lot of customization. But yeah, there's definitely still, you know, artifacts of those groups in there. I'm sure. Yeah, that was something I wanted to. I wanted to uh, notice because you mentioned that. And I, I feel like if I wasn't working at YNAB, I probably would still have those old, old groups <laughs> back from, from back That's in the funny. day, like rainy day funds and things like that. Uh, if, if you know, you know, it's just, it's very nostalgic. <laughs> for me, so. I like it. I mean, you know, whatever, all nostalgic for our era or whatever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, right. um, cool. yeah. The, so then the next group is fixed monthly costs. 
Um, and so uh -huh. the monthly expenses, the first group is kind of just like me, the swipe of the card. The second category is kind of cost. I know I'm gonna have every month. And these I kept mm -hmm. really small. There's only two categories in there. One is monthly fixed bills. And again, I used to have mm -hmm. like streaming services as one and health insurance as one and, uh, or insurances yeah. maybe, or whatever. Um, but I think that I, I guess something that I dawned on me is like, you're allowed to click into the categories, right? And so, <laughs> yeah. you know, you can actually look right. and see how, what you're spending money <laughs> right. on. You're it's allowed okay. to look. And there's not that there's not that many, right? So there's like I maybe have twelve fixed monthly bills or whatever it is. And if and you know, so that that month that amount of money for me is eight eighty nine. And if that's too high, I can just look at it. And you know, if I do look at it, you know, I, I just know off the top of my head that most of that eighty nine is actually health insurance. And so it's not like it's some like reckless Netflix binge I've gone on. You know, it's like mostly, <laughs> right. it's mostly, you know, so it, you it's know, pretty chill. I don't need to really keep streaming services as a separate category because I can just look at that if I think that's like an area that I need to improve on. And otherwise, I kind of like just keeping it more simple because those are going to be the same every month. And it's one click away from honing down like when I want to, to like analyze what's going on there. Yeah, I do the same thing. I have a fixed bills category and, uh, yeah, it's anything that doesn't change and is every month and uh i don't put streaming services in there though but i, I might think about that because that that is interesting i think i only put like uh, i don't know like i guess like the adulty things you know like the not not like entertaining things yeah. you know um but it is nice to have just one category for those things because i feel like it's just i don't get it i know you you were you, you separate all that i out, have right? them all it's, separate just because i always have but i've been thinking about it for a long time because i'm like yeah it makes sense. They they're the same amount every single month. I could just lump right. them all together. But I think I'll, part I'll, of me I'll too. I put them in the note too. Like I set, like write down a note what what all the bills are, and that helps. Yeah. Even though I don't really have to do that either, because you can always just look at the activity, and you could like literally see it listed. You know. I think part but, of me is just I want to be able to communicate with Christy what we spend our money on every single month. So when she pops oh, into Wineab, okay. she can see. Oh, here are the monthly bills. Really quick access. Yeah, that's really interesting, too, because with you and Christy, it's like um, when she looks at YNAB, I know she's not like super in it every day. So like when she looks at YNAB, it's almost more like uh, almost like reporting what's going on. And so if you collapsed at all, it might she might lose a lot of visibility. Right. Yeah. yeah. But then it, I also know she doesn't care. So <laughs> I really could set it up however yeah, I want. Yeah, she wouldn't care. Would she? So... <laughs> We need to have Christy on. She's like, where'd my little categories like, go? I don't really care what Ernie does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, so you got one more on that group. And right? then the other one is is housing. I do keep that one separate because I think it's interesting. Ah, okay. um, and, you know, for I was a lifelong renter up until I was 38 years old. And so housing was, um, you know, rent and maybe some other stuff. What's what some housing, actually? I'm like looking through. I'm digging down into my housing category right now. Um, yeah, is that like utility bills and things like that too, or is that just the the mortgage? No, I think I put utilities in the other one. So I guess now my housing is exactly two things: it's my HOA um, and it's mm -hmm. my property tax. Um, and I okay. don't have a mortgage because uh, I paid my nice. house off, and so um, yeah, it's just those two things right now, which is okay, pretty nice. Yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, still got to pay the HOA. <laughs> yeah, I know. San Diego. <laughs> It's only three units on my HOA, though, so I, there's there's limited uh, politics and drama, which I don't like for That's insurance. That's good. If you can get a chill HOA, right. it can actually be a good thing, Yeah, right? it actually is. It's nice so. to not to... We all have a shared... We all have a shared disinterest in, in like, upgrades to the exterior <laughs> of the home because no one right, wants to, like, right. put, out, put out the money. Yeah, it's good. All right, next group, rainy day funds. And so this is there the... Is. Yep, the wine that's another four. Four. I have for... I, I just... I, the, I'm sorry, the nostalgia. Right, because <laughs> rule three, like when I when I say the rules now, I kind of like default to the old rules. I have to like remind myself, I have to translate uh, to what they call now. But um, yeah, rule yeah, three now used we're to probably be... going to change them again. So you're going to be like two rules <laughs> behind. Rules <laughs> Man, just what I'm thinking about. Um, yeah, rule three used to be save for a rainy day. Now it's embrace your true expenses. Is that correct? Okay. That's right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And and save for a rainy day meant, you know, just because. Christmas isn't in May doesn't mean you're not going to have $500 of Christmas gifts to buy in December. And it's a better practice to, you know, maybe save 50 bucks a month for that and then have a calm Christmas instead of a panicked broke Christmas. Um, and so I actually do, you know, my categories for that are five and they have car maintenance, 
Um, and that kind of goes back to my early 99 Ford Explorer days where it was a very common, you know, it was about once a year for about 500 bucks. I'd have to take it and fix something. And so I wanted money in there. Um, I have one, another one called professional services. That's for things like accountants, primarily, occasionally a lawyer or something. I don't really have lawyers personally very much, um, things like that. Another one is gifts. That is kind of like your Christmas category um, or just birthday gifts, whatever. Vacation. Mm -hmm. I put vacation there because vacation is not really like a monthly expense. It's more like every however often I go on vacation, you want to have some money saved up for that. And then I have an annual fixed bills one in there where things that aren't um, hitting my account every month, but things that are hitting it annually, which might, you know, kind of oscillate more than your, your like monthly amount. Um, mm -hmm. But there's very few of those. And so, yeah, that, that category, you know, I, I guess the nature of that category is it's a little bit more chaotic because it's not so regular every month. It's like, ooh, right. I had a bigger vacation or different accountant bill this year or whatever it is. Um, but I think it's still nice to have money scheduled for that. Cool. This isn't going to make any sense, but I just created an annual fixed bills category for my true oh, expenses. I, 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 I didn't do it with the individual <laughs> monthly ones, but with the irregulars, I'm like, hey, it's the same amount that I put in every single month. Let's just roll it all up into one category. And right. I love it. Yeah, it's it re, it's it makes sense. It reduced know? my category. I mean, I got rid of like five to seven categories. Uh, I don't know if you've heard. But I feel like it's been a long time since I talked about it. But I had a annual yearly no uh, what words a, <laughs> a yearly fixed bills category, and I I was I got so obsessive about optimizing the exact amount that i put in there to where I, I told ernie like i was i had like a spreadsheet where i was like projecting out like okay if i put if i start with this amount and then i put this much amount i'll be good for like seven years but on the seventh year i'll be <laughs> off by two dollars <laughs> and then on the end so that's gonna <laughs> and, and it was like and eventually i, I like tried this for so long and i was like what am i doing like this is so dumb because i would project out with the spreadsheet for like like, like not seven years. It was like three years, and I'm like, it's gonna change in that time anyway. Yeah. And it was so silly. So now I just, I just stick an amount in there that that I feel like it's gonna be good, and it's it's fine. It doesn't have to be perfect, <laughs> you know. Roll with the punches. <laughs> That's still a I know. <laughs> or just like I just like didn't want to leave any money on the table. You know, yeah. I wanted to have like down to the cent exactly how much needed to go in there and not any more. But now it's just like, this is stupid. Like I'm spending a lot more time worrying about yeah. it. Than it is and worth. when you started, so. I'm sure it was for a good reason, right? Maybe there was some necessity there. I, I think there. it was just because I was being a weird nerd. And <laughs> I, I, but I also think it was because like I had gone from lots of categories down to one and I was like a little worried that I was going to get myself in trouble. So I was like, oh, I got to okay. do all the math. But no, you're fine. Just 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 set some money aside. Because it's tricky because you like you say, like, you can't just say, Oh, I have, you know, Amazon Prime, uh, that's a hundred dollars, so I'll put in I don't know what 100 divided by 12 is, whatever that is. Uh, nine? Is that nine? Anyways, <laughs> you know, I'll put in nine bucks and it'll be fine. But it's like, oh, no, but that one comes out in July and it's already, we're already in February. So you have to backfill yeah, it a little bit. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, prorate it. You know, I was over overthinking massively. Uh, now I just, just keep it chill. But, <laughs> but that's a whole, that's a whole thing. Yeah, I think it's kind of uh, like dog hair. Like if you have a dog, the solution to, dog hair is not to get every hair up in your house and your car the solution is just to like kind of accept that that's your life now and yes, you know like exactly every penny is not going to be categorized right it just that's not how the world works that's not how behavior works that's not how subscriptions work whatever um so you just kind of have to like come to an acceptance be like hey you know there's gonna be a few dollars floating here and there you can move them whenever it seems right but you know the the whole point isn't to like have some like, you know, pixel perfect view of your of of projection years ahead. It's to have like a pretty good sense of where you're at and and make informed decisions um, when yeah. those when those times come. And I think that's a good message for wine because where we err, we tend to err on 
being a little bit too obsessive. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. So, just everybody chill out. You know, it's <laughs> chill fine. Guys. fine. Just, <laughs> just calm down, yeah, everybody. not be listening to a podcast called Budget Nerds for Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. no, I mean, listen to it. Yeah, 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 don't yeah. stop listening. Yeah, yeah. But uh, <laughs> just <kidding. laughs> chill out. <laughs> oh, man, I love it. Okay, cool. Uh, so is that all your rainy day funds? That's all my rainy day funds. And yeah, just for, I, I've been saying numbers. So if, if you want to keep track on that, the biggest category oh, that sure. is vacation, which is love and 50. And I kind of, you know, nice. what, the first thing I loosened up on with my spending when I came into money is basically traveling. And if people ask, like, if I had an opportunity to travel, I just say yes. And so, I mean, it's obviously a huge amount of money, 1150 bucks a month on, on traveling compared to, um, you know, the my three hundred dollar or four hundred dollar grocery bill or whatever it is. <laughs> well, it shows um, what you value, you know. Right. That's great. Um, but yeah, yeah, like you know, and also you know, often cover for my friends or whoever it is when we're we're going somewhere. So you know, that's flights and nice. hotels and um, uh, you know, activities and all that stuff. And you know, it doesn't come up every month, but you know, every few months I spend a few thousand bucks or whatever. Just booked an Airbnb yeah. last night to uh, Joshua Tree, nice. which is near San oh, Diego. Oh, nice. Yeah, we were there for a wine up retreat. Well, we were in Palm Springs and nice. uh, visited Joshua Tree. And I wish I could have spent more time there because we were only there for like a few hours. And I was like, man, this is this place oh, is cool. awesome. You know, <laughs> I wanted to be there for at night and like see the stars. Uh, I know it's yeah. like one of those spots where you can like actually see the Milky Way and like really see some amazing things. Yeah, but uh, maybe maybe that'll be uh, a, a trip one day. That'd be cool. Nice. Okay, so you really value traveling, and I'll, also I love you. Know, you mentioned that you you'll sometimes. Uh, uh, pay the way for your friends. So that's a really cool way to be generous and, and, um, you know, really make it possible for some people that might not be able to travel as much. So that's cool too. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things about that was weird about coming into money was I just assumed that people who have money, I, I don't know, can just freely buy things for their friends. But like, that's not always true. You know, sometimes I'll be like, let yeah. me get this, let me get this dinner tab or whatever. By the way, I'm not like super, I'm not like billionaire. Well, it's like I'm buying restaurants, but like, you know, for sure, like right. I'm happy to pick up dinner sometimes or whatever. Um, but you know, people are weird about that. People are like, no, I don't want you on a yeah. like or anything. And so it's awkward. Yeah. Right. It's like, I always thought like the main constraint in life was just the ability to pay um but now i realize it's like now nah, there's like you know social things and um mm -hmm. you know relationship things and things like that and so um yeah i don't want to if my friends listen to that they're gonna be like he well he never bought me a trip <laughs> <laughs> so, so, oh yeah sorry not yeah. Everyone. sorry Jerry's i mean, i'm the one that brought it up so i don't want to like paint <laughs> too too rosy of a picture yeah i get it no there's uh yeah there's the ability to pay and then there's like the uh the social awkwardness of it all i guess yeah. really you know yeah that's true that's true all right next group they're starting to get more abstract the uh you know i know mine weren't they didn't nice. even start all that specific but they're getting more abstract so i have a, a, a group called other spending um one is okay. charitable um which it says on my screenshot two dollars but actually i have started donating through my business and my personal finance club we donate 25 percent of our profits and we've donated Two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars so far over the last five years, and so um, right, and that is your money. That that could go to you. Oh yeah, so. yeah that could go directly to <laughs> my bank account. Um, and yeah, so exactly. yeah, I, I guess I just want to call it because I'm not looking at this two dollars. <laughs> You're like, spending. it's not just two dollars. <laughs> um, I don't know why it says two dollars. I do feel like I, I like often donate from my bank account too. I don't know why it says two dollars. So charitable uh, reimbursal expenses and home maintenance, and so reimbursal expenses. I don't know that one. I I. This is again. I feel very uh, like unworthy explaining things to the actual budget nerds, but um, but I've always had a problem with like if I had to cover something out of my personal bank account for a work expense that they're going to mm. pay me back for, you know, weeks later or whatever. Um, like where does that go? And so that I just right. made this reimbursable expenses category where it, that just kind of is this like float category where. You know, um, it could go negative. I know there was like the whole issue with like the right red arrow that d no longer exists. So I would actually carry a negative balance there, but now you kind of have to, yeah, you know, fund it some other way. But it's not, you know, mm -hmm. a big deal. Um, and then yeah, home maintenance. That's maybe that should go into housing. I don't know. That's just like, I don't know why it's in that group, but um, that's like actually that one says thirty five fifty because just last weekend I had two major appliances installed in my home, oh. uh, two mini split air conditioning units and a new washer dryer. And so I spent all weekend 
kind of like managing the installation of these things and doing it myself in one case when the washer dryer people wouldn't do it for some reason um yeah so, yeah, yeah. yeah that's one of those like usually it's zero per month but then sometimes it's thousands of dollars i i literally have an old washing machine on a dolly sitting outside right now really? because i me and my wife got it on a dolly we're trying to pull it up the st- or outside stairs and then it started like pouring down raining and we ran back inside so so the, the washing machine it's it's a junk washing machine it's just gonna go to the dump because oh, okay. it's no longer any good actually i think we're gonna put it on the curb and uh do like the old curb alert thing on facebook and somebody someone pick will it up pick it up use it for parts or yep. <laughs> someone will pick it up and use it for parts <laughs> so so we'll probably do that and uh yeah it's just sitting out there because uh it started pouring rain and we haven't had a chance to haul it up the steps yet but <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> so i'm right there with you on the on the plants luckily they Stuff, did haul yeah. my old one away which was yeah a huge relief to not to deal uh, with that. Washing machines are the worst. I I have thrown out my back twice moving washing machines. Oh, really? so, <laughs> I've been moving mine yeah, all weekend and I was like, like this is what, 400 pounds? I should probably... Uh, yeah, it's bad because you there's nowhere to hold on to. It. You have to like hold on the bottom, and you, you you end up having to bend over, you know, lift it the way you can. Yeah. You're not supposed to. I'm about rocking it. I rock. Mine's a mine's a tower, so I rock left to right and try to like you know walk and walk it around. Yeah, it's bad. I, I I moved I moved a washing machine for a friend. Uh, he had like a rental house, and I had to move one from his house to the rental house. And I threw out my back, and they felt so bad. His wife is a physical therapist, so she came over and, <laughs> and treated me <laughs> because I destroyed my back because I moved her washing oh. machine. And so she's like, "Here, you get a free physical therapy." Session. That seems like a fair trade at the middle. Yeah, I thought so. I, I thought used to fair. be a mattress delivery person. And so I would always take out old mattresses from oh, people's yeah. houses. I would rather any day move a washing machine, an appliance, instead of an old mattress. Those were just <laughs> Wait, the why? worst. Because it's gross? It's or gross. It's really and gross. They're, they're really difficult to handle. When, yeah, yeah, they're floppy. And you're going you know? upstairs yeah. and around stairs. And it was difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. washing machine, you just throw it on a dolly and you mattress. just need some strength. That's weird. Yeah, exactly. I, I feel like you probably all saw all sorts of horrifying things doing that. <laughs> oh job. my goodness! <laughs> I mean, I remember like like anytime I had like a repair person in or something, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, the house is such a mess, and they're like, <laughs> we have seen some things. <laughs> they're like, your house is not a mess, <laughs> please. <laughs> so, oh man. Anyway, all right. So that so that's the um, anything else in that group there? Yeah, other spending notes supposed to be charitable, reimbursable, and home maintenance. I feel like home maintenance is probably going rainy day funds. I don't know why it's there. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I'm actually going to move that. Um, oh, we're moving it right now. Yeah. And a live changing of the <laughs> yeah. budget. Look, my, look at this. Where's my? Why? I'm looking at. <laughs> I'm looking at a screenshot I sent you just so we we're looking at the same thing, but my live version. I can drag. Can I drag this? Yeah. There we go. Okay, it's dragged. There we go. Change made. All See right. Ben, it's that easy. <laughs> <All right. laughs> <laughs> it's that easy. I yeah. I, I I we joke about how I have such a hard time changing anything. It's really? just my security blanket. If I move something, it's horrifying. But <laughs> All right, we got uh, one last, yeah, last group. group. Yeah, last group is savings, and so that's kind of again kind of one of these abstract categories. One I just have straight up emergency fund, where that's where you know right now there's five thousand bucks in there or so, um, and you know I, I have more cash in my non-budget account and my tracking account which is like investment account and so like mm-hmm. that's not really technically my whole emergency fund but i think in concept you know actually there on a jesse podcast he mentioned like yeah why not just have a ton of money in your in your checking account um because people get uncomfortable with that but it's actually not that big of a deal it's not like some huge you know missed opportunity you don't want to have all your money in your checking account but having like 10 or 20 grand or something like isn't crazy if you're to that point right. um and then beyond that you can start talking about making sure you're investing or whatever and so um yeah i've, I've got five thousand yeah. dollars in emergency fund then my last category is investment savings and again this one i feel a little bit weird about because i feel like i might be doing it wrong but when i'm like moving big amounts of money um between accounts like let's say i take money out of my brokerage account or i'm like could invest a bunch of money in my brokerage account. Like that investment savings account is kind of like the transitionary um, account. Like maybe I should be using like um, money to assign or something like that. Um, but for some reason, I found I need just a place to throw chunks of money when it's like 
on its way to or from um, an investment. Right. Makes account. sense because right. those investment accounts are tracking accounts for you. So you, they need that right. category to basically leave the budget. Yeah, that's right. Okay, good. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. <laughs> You're like, good, approved. <laughs> I was like, am I going to get berated on this? You're doing the categories no, wrong. Never, <laughs> no, never, never. The only thing we'll berate you about is is not using a cash account because we love that so much. <laughs> and something... <laughs> actually, actually... Yeah. Well, well some, th- something else I noticed there are no emojis on your categories or your oh, groups. Yeah. Just, just not, not an emoji, emoji person. guy. Not. Well, it's funny because my, you know, my personal finance education I do is mostly infographics that are yeah. all emoji. Based. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, if you look at if you if you look at Jeremy's social media, yeah, it's like all emojis everywhere, right? But I do think the emoji thing is also like a relic of of my era because I don't think emojis mm-hmm. maybe weren't even supported back then. I don't know. I don't or think so. Certainly weren't yeah. as popular in the world as they are now. Um, and yeah, so well, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Like back in wind up four days, like emojis weren't yeah. even really a thing anyway. So yeah. <laughs> didn't really think about it. Um, and so I don't know. I just didn't transition. <laughs> I, I do well, feel like... was the same way. And so like what, like a year ago, yeah. you start, you finally yeah, added some color to your, cool your plan there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I go overboard sometimes. Like my fixed bills category has an emoji for every bill that's associated with it. So like I have like seven emojis next to the, next to the category I name. I don't know how you do that, silly, man, but, but I love it. Do you well, find yourself wanting if the, they don't have the right emoji? I, like it's like a daily uh, experience oh, yeah. for me where I'm like, you don't have this. Come on, this emoji is so obvious. I don't know who the know, emoji people are, but they need to. Come on, you need to at least have one for every bill because yeah. I can't handle that. My, my favorite is life insurance, which is just a little skull because nice. you know that's really what it is. It's really death insurance. So, <laughs> so, so just just reminds me of my mortality every every day when I look at my budget. So, well, there, <laughs> there we have go. it. Five groups, right? One, two, three, four, five, sixteen categories, and then you also have the credit card payment category with super with, chill. Uh, four credit cards there. Yeah. But yeah, super chill. I love it. Yeah, and two of those credit yeah. cards actually felt bad selling that screenshot too. Because two, two of those category, two of those credit cards, I actually only use two credit cards, and the other two I just need to like close or get rid of. I use mm-hmm. I use my oldest credit card, which I keep all my recurring bills on, and uh, and you keep your oldest card for credit score reasons, so you have a long length of credit. Then I use my favorite credit card, where I get like the points of the the day or whatever on, and so I try to keep it really simple with credit cards. And then if I want to change my favorite credit card. At least all my recurring bills don't have to. I don't have to go update the mm. credit card number in like twenty websites. It's a good idea. Um, and so there's really just two credit cards. I'm. I try not to be one of those crazy credit card people. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, not like Ernie used to be. One of those yeah, credit, I'm trying to get out of that game because it's day, just right? uh, it's too much. <laughs> I'm getting sick of it. <laughs> not that you're crazy, guys, but you know you're crazy. <laughs> you're a little bit crazy. They know well, how crazy they are. <laughs> they know it. They know it. All right. I also <laughs> want to hear about YNAB routines and rituals that you have. It sounds like there's a a monthly ritual there where you're updating your tracking accounts. But just walk us through the monthly ritual, or what does YNAB look like for you day to day or week to week? Yeah, you know, that's that's been a big shift for me. Early on, it was if I'm, you know, I go to, I, I shop at Vons and there's like a moment if they if they have a bagger, which they usually do, there's like that awkward moment where you've already put everything on the on the on the um conveyor belt and uh. it's not yet all bagged. And so then you're just kind of like staring there. So that was the moment where I pulled the wine ab. <laughs> I'd like right. move the money, you know, it was the perfect time to like, you know, check my categories, uh, enter the transaction when I was doing that. Um, yeah, I feel like self-checkout really messed with with <laughs> budget routine, you know, because uh, like now you, do, you don't get like a chance to like have that awkward moment where like I might as well enter this into wine app, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it, it depends on the size of my grocery trip if it's like under 10 items i'm usually going self-checkout otherwise i still i don't know this, this whole podcast makes me sound well i was like all gung-ho self-checkout originally but now it's like uh, if there's any produce anything the things that are like start making noise and be like assistance is on the way and then it's only on the way like half time so you're like stuck yeah. you're like you're uh stuck for, for me now it's the, any big grocery trip is is a pickup because oh. i have four kids and and it's 
a flipping nightmare to bring kids into a grocery store. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, yeah, that, that's not even a thing, but yeah, it, it's, it's all self checkout because for like the short trips, but, uh, nice. but yeah, you know, some, every once in a while, I'll just like go into the actually talk to a human and it's nice, you know? Yeah. So I feel like we got a little obsessed with self checkout and I feel like the tide has turned and I feel like things are coming back like Walmart, like everybody's <laughs> stealing everything in the whole world. <laughs> they're like freaking out. Yeah. They're like, what why is everybody stealing everything? It's like, well, because they can, because you know, yeah. you made it really easy. <laughs> yeah, no. I remember, I remember the days where it was brand new and it was like this futuristic robotic uh, yeah. you know, idea. Like you can, like you can scale, like people are so amazed by this concept. Then it was, it was like terrible for so long. And now we're getting to the point where it's like, it's actually pretty good. And then right. I feel like size, well. like, but we don't like this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, we hate this, and yeah, and the the companies are starting to hate it because they're they're right. desperate to exactly. stop the the, sh- the shoplifting. But anyway, all right. So yeah, so I yeah, I, that's what I used to. Now you know, now checking my categories is more like a once every few days things. I'm like, you know, when I it's still Winamp is on my home screen on my phone, and so when I pull up my phone, I try, I try to keep limited icons on like my first screen on my phone mm-hmm. is that what you call it your home screen and so i have like yeah. gmail calendar google keep which is like notes google drive mm-hmm. and then like ynab is on there and so then like when ynab alerts me i have like uncategorized transactions like every few days i come in and just you know categorize the ones that need it you know kind of look at the budget but again that's like realistically less of what i do these days but the more of what i do is the monthly thing where i'm clicking reconcile on every single budget and tracking account every single month. Mm-hmm. And so I'll, you know, the kind of hardest one is um, my checking account because I don't link my checking account. I don't know why. I don't know if it doesn't allow me to, or I made a decision that I want. I think it's because I want my own separate record from the bank. And so my my check account, I am entering every transaction. But like, you know, again, it's like maybe 12 a month, you know, there's a, right. and, and, and a couple of those actually do get automatically entered because they're transfers from a credit card that is mm-hmm. um, that is linked, and then the others either update it. I enter it at the moment, like I just you know paid for the air conditioning or whatever, so I entered that. And then yeah, I go through and click reconcile every single account. I compare it to um, the statements from my banks or investment accounts, and then I oh, so are of, you getting like are you old school like getting paper statements and comparing it to that? Like I uh, don't get paper statements. Or, but um, okay, okay, okay. Uh, I, I, go I wanted to the it websites. to be more romantic than it was. <laughs> no. <for> us. <laughs> You're like opening By an way, envelope. I'm actually a computer scientist who like <laughs> yeah, like yeah, builds right. technology for a living. And so You're like, come on, man. I'm not. Doing paper. <laughs> I know. I'm not I was that just like, old. how much is this like balance in a checkbook back in the day? Yeah. But no, yeah, yeah, you, 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 of course, you look at look at it online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Although I was always the balance my checkbook guy too. But like I, I was like in my 20s when it dawned on me that like most people don't even do that anymore. They just like they just. Look I, I at never their, did it. You yeah. Know? I mean, um, Ernie's ten years older than me, and I think you're a little older than me, Jeremy. And yeah, I, I never once have balanced a checkbook. That's not a thing. So, <laughs> you know, I, I like yeah. When I was, I was like lucky. I was a kid, and I kind of got introduced to it as a parent by my parents. And like we like wrote in the number, like on it was like an actual checkbook. You like wrote in the number, and then when I you know became like a teen and realized that like computers were a thing, I started doing it on a computer. <laughs> Um, and then I realized like most people, like, you know, when the internet came around people like, yeah, you don't need to do that anymore. You can just see the balance, which yeah. like, I was like, but what if it's wrong? Like you need your, you, know, <laughs> right. you need, you need your For a record, long time, right? I think people held on to that, but we yeah. still do it with white app, but it's yeah. just not, it's all digital. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. And so that's, um, that's, that's what I do every month. Click reconcile. And then I, you know, I can click all accounts and I see, my you know my net worth as of this moment and like if i ever have like an when you click all accounts it says you like your cleared balance and your uncleared balance like that uncleared balance makes me feel very uncomfortable because that's like like outstanding issues that i haven't you know reconciled away yet um yeah and so as of as of today my my working balance is 5.1 million dollars which is really nice and if you look at my nice um you know my first month of using mine if i scroll all the way down it was it was one hundred two thousand dollars which was, you know, wasn't bad for a dude making 36,000 a year because yeah. I was saving, you know, I was earning 36,000 spending, you know, 36 was my take home. So, um, and then my, um, I was spending maybe 31,000, you know, two or 3,000 bucks a month. And I was saving 5,000 bucks a year or so. I was putting into a Roth IRA, investing in index funds. And so from the age of like kind of 23 to 34 or whatever, I had built a net worth of, you know, over a hundred thousand dollars. 
Um, yeah, it's legit. And, you know, once you include compound growth and continuing on, I would have I would have been a millionaire kind of the old fashioned way just from saving and investing on that limited salary. Uh, but yeah, then I had the windfall. And so um, when you mm-hmm. look at my net worth chart in YNAB, all years. It's like a hockey puck, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, there was, there was a big jump. I or wish it was like the, I, I guess I wish there was a big jump. But like since then, you know, even after the sale of my company, it jumped to, um, you know, 2.3 million. And there's some weird like yeah. taxes paid. And so there's some jumps around. But like the mm-hmm. last few years, it's just been like kind of, I still kind of live relatively frugally and then have most of my money invested. And so it grows. And so now kind of all the fluctuations on my net worth, it's less about like paying down debt and, and, and saving. It's more about the growth of the market at this point. Right. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a lot of your practices didn't really change. You're still saving and investing and, and, um, squirreling away as much as you can. And that continued all the way through. The only thing that really changed sounds like is your categories got simpler as you didn't need to pay as like close attention to the toothpaste category or <laughs> whatever yeah, yeah. it is, you know? So yeah, that's cool. I love that. And if we haven't already, let's make sure we show, uh, a fo- uh, screenshot of that net worth report because it is amazing. It is all of your YNAB history. It is from the very beginning, oh, nice. right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's one of these beautiful net worth reports that we see on Reddit from time to time. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Are you seeing that, I Ben? I don't have one. I, I I haven't seen his because uh, I don't think I think I don't think I was on the email chain, so I think I missed okay. it. But, uh, it, it oh, is right. amazing. Yeah, and we'll post it here on the on the video. But it's cool to see. I'm curious. You, you mentioned the, the fluctuations. What is a, you know, a, a, an amount that kind of makes you notice month to month, like, oh, something's different here, whether up or down? Is there a certain amount or? So I, I literally, you know, it's early May. And so I just anticipation of this podcast, I was reconciling um, last night and I was like, oh, I lost $125,000 last month. Um, and I, I wouldn't, you know, when I say loss, what I mean is most of my net worth, most of my wealth is in investments right now, you know? So like mm-hmm. my cash holdings is maybe, you know, 20 or $30,000 and the other five point whatever million dollars is in investments. And last month, April, 2024 was kind of a rough month for the stock market down, you know, 5% or whatever. And that cost me, you know, cost me again, I'm using quotes here. Cause I know people, you guys talk, you know, I really separate this. Like I said, my two rules are like live below your means and invest early and often. Like, like so mm-hmm. much of YNAB is kind of about the spending, you know, your expenses, you know, but like investing is like this whole other world, but right. investing is like the best investors are really, really non-reactive to that court of side, mm-hmm. sort of stuff. Yeah. So using words like lost or, uh, or something like that, it's, you feel like it's too reactive. You want to use. Something yeah, exactly. Word. And, and I, a lot of people new to investing, think they should do something about that. And right. and if you take a lesson away from this, learn that like, I didn't even notice because I don't care because part of investing is you are accepting that short-term volatility in exchange yeah. for long-term growth, right? Like historically, uh, a high yield savings account might get you 2%. You know, right now it's actually doing better, like, you know, fours, maybe even low fives or something. But three years ago, you'd get 0.1%. And, but historically, the stock market, the U.S. stock market returns about 10%, but it's not a guaranteed 10%. It's not a smooth 10%. It's kind of a, um, you're accepting that short-term volatility in ex- expectation of the long-term higher growth. And you only get that long-term higher growth if you just stay the course, if you just kind of put your money in, leave it for years. And so, you know, I think part of like the YNAB and liberal your means and invest early and often mentality is you know, you got all your categories, you spend below your means, then you take a little bit extra every month and just squirrel it away into, you know, an index fund and then just leave it for a very long period of time um, and just accept the fact that there's going to be some scary headlines that you need to ignore. There's going to be some ups and downs um, yeah. and, you know, it's going to work out in the end. Yeah, I just remember, you know, you're you're in this for the long, long haul. So something that happens in some country somewhere one month isn't going to Right. It's not going to affect you long term. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I have four tracking accounts uh, two for me, two for Christy. And yeah, last month I noticed they took a dip. And it was kind of significant, but I just, and then when I look at my net worth report, it, it never really freaks me out one way or the other. I don't get overly excited, don't get overly freaked out. 
I'm um, just kind of like, oh, that's what happened and, and kind of move on. Yeah. That's a great mentality. There's this famous study that I'm not 100% sure it's true. I'm going to repeat it now, but I will give the, the anecdote that, you know, the, the word in the street is fidelity did a study. And okay. they try to identify the the best investors, um, like by demographic. Is it based on education, country of origin, age, gender, uh, you know, occupation? What you know, are there certain types of people that are just better at investing? Like you know, there must be right. Like you, there you have this like image of like Wall Street traders, like like shaking pieces of paper over their head, or like these like day traders in their basement with like looking at all these charts. Like who are these people? And they just they discovered two distinct groups of people who outperformed all the other investors on average. And those two groups of people who were the best investors were dead people and people who forgot they had an account. <laughs> um, oh no. Because people are like trying like all these like active investors trying so hard and it's just <laughs> they lose out to dead people. <laughs> totally. And and you know, I don't know exactly if that's true, but I know that in concept it's hundred percent true. true it? Because yeah. you know, while like, you know, setting your categories and your spending and, and re really conscious spending is a very active thing that you need to take part in, mm -hmm. investing is not. Investing is a really passive thing that mm -hmm. that the more you mess with it, the more likely you are to hurt yourself rather than help yourself. And so it's really true that the best investors, you know, spend a few hours learning, figuring out how to open the accounts, put their money in, minimize their fees, buy and hold, and then just leave it for long periods of time and just, you know, put more money away. The people who are opening up charts and reading the newspaper and making moves and switching strategies and yada, 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 like every time they do that, it just opens up an ability for kind of the market to take advantage of your missteps rather than you're guaranteeing yourself that growth by staying the course. Yeah, that's this is my interest, like that. guys. Sorry, I get really amped about. This. Yeah, no, well, I, let's let's talk let's talk more about that because you you've been teaching that that basically. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the main thing that you've been teaching for the past five, six, seven years. But uh, now you have a product that I think could help a lot of wine ever. So why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, so basically, what that's what I've been doing for the last five years is teaching personal finance and and investing. And you know, the question I'd always get is, how do I find a good financial advisor? Mm -hmm. And for years, I would, it, it was a tough question because the financial advice industry is full of kind of really, Jerks. you know, <laughs> yeah. I'll say it. I was going to say the nice way it's possible, but I was saying misaligned incentives <laughs> where, <laughs> you know, if you walk into um, a random advisor's office that says financial, financial advice on the door, it's pretty likely, you know, 90% plus, they aren't really a financial advisor. They're a commissioned salesperson whose only incentive is to sell you whatever they're selling. Um, mm -hmm. Most often it's life insurance, which is strange because you, you know, a lot of people, you know, maybe if you're a new listener, luckily you found YNAB, which is a great community. But, uh, you know, if you're just new to YNAB, you might have walked into a financial advisor office being like, oh, I need help with my spending or my 401k or, uh, you know, balancing accounts or whatever. And they might, say a few words about that and then say, let's talk about life insurance. And you leave that meeting right. and you're like, why did that financial advisor suddenly, I didn't, ha I don't have kids or I didn't talk, I didn't ask about life. And, but they have a very right. convincing sales pitch and they say, you know, yeah, you might so, not even need life insurance. Right. You, you may not even need life insurance. And, so it's all right. If you, yeah. you know, don't have kids and you dying wouldn't be a financial crisis for anyone, you probably don't even mm -hmm. need life insurance. Um, and then, you know, there's other shades of gray too. Like there's, there's, financial advisors and quotes who just sell you in investment products, which is better because at least it's not just these like high fee insurance products, but you know, they're just selling you whatever they get commissioned from. And then there's another group of uh, financial advisors who um, want to manage all of your investments for an annual fee called like assets under management. And th that's kind of like better than the other two, but still there's some problems with it. First, those types of advisors will only work with you if you have, you know, at least a few hundred thousand dollars and then once you once they do work with you, um, that percent they charge every year compounds over time and actually has a pretty drastic negative impact on your long term growth because minimizing those fees can be a benefit. Um, and so for years, people say, "How do I find a good financial advisor?" And I'd kind of give them a pitch like that and say, "What you really want to find is like what's called flat fee or advice only financial advisor, where you pay just for an hour or just for a project." Uh, you know, a set price, and then that advisor has no incentive other than to, you know, help you look at your investments, look at your 401k, whatever you help with, whatever you need help with, but no sales pitch or whatever. And then uh, the, you know, person I was talking to would say, oh, that sounds great. How do I find one of those? And my answer would be, 
I have no idea. <laughs> really. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, good luck. I don't know. They, not many people do that. They're hard to find. Um, mm. And so, yeah, about a year ago, my my team and I started a company called Nectarine, which is an advice only uh, financial advisor marketplace where you just put in your state, you can filter based on what you're looking for, and then it shows you financial advisors who have all agreed to charge $150 for a one hour engagement. And then you can share your screen, you can show them your 401k, you can show them your IRA, you can talk about rollovers, you can do whatever you want. And then you can compare them all. There's reviews around the site, you check out right through the site. Um, it's just a way to like get access to real fiduciary vetted financial advisors. There's all these words out there, fiduciary, CFP, you know, all that stuff. I mean, the, at, at the end of the day, they're all licensed vetted fiduciaries. Many have their CFPs, whatever it is, but they're just not, they're only incentivized to help you and get a good review, not, you know, sell you something. And so that's what, yeah. that's what Nectarine is. And thanks for it's letting just me kind uh, of the, give the down pitch. and dirty. You just give them money. They give you advice. <laughs> it's not like anything complicated. Um, right. So they're it, actually incentivized to help. Yeah. It's like a new business model. Again, I'm using air quotes for those listening, not watching. Yeah. Um, but it's the simplest business model, which is, you know, kind of like what an accountant does or a lawyer does. You like pay them for their expertise rather than get into this really complex uh, arrangement with them where they're getting a piece of every time you invest or they're you know draining money from your investment account. Um, and, you know, um, clients so far have loved it because they're like, wow, it's like a breath of fresh air to have someone who actually sits next to me and is like on my team, not like trying to like push their agenda with my finances. So um, we really feel really good about the model and what it's doing. And yeah, just thanks yeah, for uh, I, letting me plug it. Yeah, I think Nectarine is going to be a good force for, a force for good in the world and um, definitely need it because, yeah, like you said, it's hard to find people because, yeah, because it is kind of a newer way of of doing financial advising. Um, because for so long it was all fee based or, or, uh, uh, assets under management based at least or something like that. I think it's because back in the day, you know, if we're talking like eighties or something, if you want right. to invest in the stock market, you, you know, there wasn't a website to go to, to invest. You had to like go to a firm who had access to people on wall street who could like make these investments. And so you out of necessity investing meant giving your money to a financial advisor who would place those investments for you. But mm -hmm. the world has shifted now and it's really, it's, you know, it's as simple as opening a YNAB account to open up an investment account and put your money in. But now, and that's really, really cheap to do. It's much less expensive to invest directly with your own money than it is to go through a, a financial firm. But then you kind of have this gap, which is people have like unlimited options in investments and like, oh, what do I invest in? And so a lot of people like go back to the financial advisor space and then they have all these weird incentives. And so we're hoping Nectarine mm -hmm. can help like, you know, stand next to you and, um, you know, choose your investments for you and things like that um, without, you know, the bad incentives. Yeah, totally. So where do we go if we want to? Oh, it's at hellonectarine.com. Thanks for the Perfect. plug. Yeah. Um, yeah, we yeah, couldn't afford nectarine.com because we're trying to uh, live below our <laughs> means. But um, yeah, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. I love that. Love that. Cool. Well, thanks for, for sharing and thanks for sharing your, your journey. It's a really interesting one. And, and Jeremy, where else can the YNAB community reach you at? Yeah, I'm an easy dude to find on the internet. Uh, my whole financial literacy brand is called Personal Finance Club. And so, yeah, you know, like I said, my two rules are live below your means, invest early and often. You're at the right place for living below your means. Like YNAB does a better job of that than I can do. But if you're at the invest early and often phase of of your wealth building journey, um, that's what we talk about. We talk about how to choose investments, timing the market, index funds, mutual funds, ETFs, like all that crazy, confusing stuff. We try to break it down really simply. Personalfinanceclub.com. And most of my content goes on Instagram at Personal Finance Club, where I have like 600,000 followers. It's amazing. People actually want to learn nice. about this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll link to all those in the description. Yeah. So grab it if you need it. Well, thanks a bunch, Jeremy. This has been really fun. Yeah, uh, anything else you, you want to add? I Yeah, I'm like such a long time YNAB fan and fan of you guys. And so <laughs> I'm just honored to be here. And thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, this has been a um, blast. And thank you for not berating me too much for how I did the category. <laughs> <one>. <laughs> no, no berating necessary. You're doing great. Uh, um, yeah, and, you know, it's it's people will do it however they want. That's 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 the point. So it's great. Cool. All right. Well, All right, friends. Thanks for hanging around for another episode. We'll see you in two weeks. Until then, happy wine-abbing. Happy wine-abbing. All right, friends. 
we have a really special announcement. I don't know if you know, but it is YNAB's 20th anniversary. So in honor of 20 years, we are holding a YNAB Fan Fest. That's right, folks. Yeah. It's a YNAB get-together on September 21st in Salt Lake City, the city where it all began. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so it's, it's going to be just a gathering of YNABers so you can actually meet people like you and nerd out about this stuff. We're going to be there. Uh, Jesse is going to be there. He's going to be given like a proper speech, I think, like on a stage, maybe. I don't know, uh, something like that. So he's going to be talking. Um, it's going to be super duper fun. And so we want you to grab your ticket as soon as possible. There's a limited number. So they're going to go fast. They are free. Just go to wineab.com slash events and you can get your ticket there. Go right now because it's probably like already sold out, but <laughs> well, sold out. You call it sold out if it's free. Like, what's the like? It, like yeah, sold out. That out? works. Yeah, I don't know. Anyways, uh, go go for it right now, right this second. Wineab.com slash events and get your ticket. We would love to see you there. <laughs> 